Welcome to the Scale Ups Podcast, where each week you get to hear Sean Steele, professional CEO, growth mentor, and advisory board chair, unpack the strategies that successful founders have used to achieve scale in their businesses. Stay tuned as he interviews the entrepreneurs who've made it, learns from industry experts, and follows a group of founders still striving to scale. G'day everyone and welcome to the Scale Ups Podcast where we help first time founders learn the secrets of scaling so they can fundamentally fulfill the potential of their business, maximize the impact they can create in the world uh, and make bigger decisions with greater confidence. I'm your host, uh, Sean Steele. And before we kick off today with my fantastic guest uh, that we have today, Nahal uh, Advani from Qualsites, I actually just wanted to acknowledge uh, our community. Uh, I haven't read out any reviews um, so far since we've recorded and we've published probably the first 20 episodes uh, now, but we've had some amazing uh, and really nice uh, and generous reviews and ratings coming through, which means a lot to us and, and to our team uh, and of course it helps get to uh, into the hands of others i want to shout out to uh, peter jeremy who said recently this is a, a you know a great podcast for anyone wanting to scale their business it's informative it's so well presented it's easy to stay engaged and to understand and, and to learn from so thanks very much peter if you're listening to this uh and if anyone out there in the audience would like us to read out theirs then obviously jump on apple podcast that's our favorite platform and drop one on there uh for us but uh without further ado our guest today is nahal advani founder and ceo of qual sites uh out of chicago you're still in chicago right now good man thanks good for man. Ah, my pleasure. Uh, now, look, those um, those who are listening might remember in episode 12, we interviewed Rashad Tabakawala, uh, who led growth and strategy for Publicis, uh, which if you haven't heard that episode, it's really a really uh, valuable and worthwhile episode. You know, that's a company with 82,000 FTE globally. And, uh, and I always believe that good people know good people. And, and Rashad uh, introduced us. I believe he's an investor and advisor to the business. Is that right? He now? is. Yes. Yeah, he's been amazing. He's uh, he's a fascinating guy, and if you haven't jumped on actually Rashad's um, uh, weekly newsletter, it's it's the only one that I read religiously. Uh, so I really really enjoy it. It's got some great uh, great insights in there. But I know people are really going to enjoy your uh, episode today, uh, Nahal, because you've had to make some pretty serious and and uh, major strategic shifts. Uh, I'm going to try avoid using the word pivot, um, <laughs> but over the last nine years to enjoy the growth that you're experiencing now. And so there's lots of uh, learnings in there. So for those who aren't familiar with your brand, just a quick overview for people. Um, the business is Qualsite, but originally you found it as Giorama, and we're going to come back to the origins of that in a minute. But to to get insights um, into customer behavior, you know, I guess typically people used to and probably still do, you know, quantitative surveys is a bit of a sort of default uh, option. They grab SurveyMonkey, they try to design something, they, they go for um, uh, that kind of survey style to get some insight into behavior. But, you know, clearly the world's moving on. Uh, and has moved on and you developed a platform that allows customers to uh, and that and the customer might be the end client the end company or maybe an agency um in between i, I imagine right. uh -huh. um to use your platform to observe and interact with customers when they're actually using or making purchases or consuming the products in the natural environment so that could be whether it's using a smartphone or a smart glass or a 360 camera or or something like that sending the data you're gathering real-time insights so that could be you know, somebody who's cleaning with a cleaning product or shopping or eating or cooking or, you know, something in real time. And then you're taking, you're applying artificial intelligence capability to help generate the insights when you're getting this stuff at scale. Uh, is that right? Have I kind of explained that? Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, traditionally when you're doing research, you're trying to understand consumer behavior, you pick between quantitative and qualitative, right? So on the quant mm -hmm. side, you've got survey tools like the survey monkeys of the world. Um, and they're good for certain things, but they lack depth and context. And then on the mm. call side, you'll do things like interviews or focus groups, or if you had money and time, maybe go to somebody's home in a non co <laughs> environment. Um, <laughs> but uh, in both those cases, there's issues, right? So in one, there lacks depth and context. In the other ones, you get that depth, but it does lack context if you're just having an interview and mm. asking somebody about, let's say, how they shopped in a store three days ago. A, um, they're not there mm. right now, so... Uh, it's not contextual, but B, it's based on recall. So it's saying like, hey, Sean, three days ago, what did you notice first? And your mind's not going to yeah. save that information. And so what yeah. we do instead is allow people using our app on their phone to capture those moments as they happen, whether that's cooking or cleaning or shopping or eating, and therefore getting true in the moment consumer behavior. And then, mm. as you mentioned, yes, we do have a whole bunch of AI that helps analyze that behavior, make it easy for our clients, which is brands and sometimes agencies, to analyze that data and then come up with uh, the appropriate insights to whether it be 
launching a new product or improving a concept or whatever it may be is a wide mm. gamut of things we help with. And there's also an issue with scale and cost, right? Like, you know, qualitative is amazing when you get Absolutely. in front of a customer. You've got a high, you've got a rich, high context conversation. Uh, so you've got a rich uh, quality conversation, but doing it across a large number of customers, especially if you've got a consumer product or something, that's, yeah, that's very expensive if you're going to do it that way. Exactly. Or you're taking expensive a small... Expensive and labor intensive, right? That's why there's all these yeah. companies that sometimes will steer away from call or just do a little bit of call and do a lot of quant because... It's just mm. cumbersome. And what we realized, that's the white space, right? There's a whole bunch of opportunity to help make qual faster, mm. easier, and more scalable uh, through the use of smart capture mechanisms in terms of capturing yep. data, but also in terms of AI, because half of the battle is capturing the data and capturing it at scale, which you can do thanks to asynchronous video on a smartphone yep. you know, globally and so on. But then the other half of the battle is analyzing that data because it's yeah. unlike a survey, which is structured. This is unstructured data. So really being able to actually make more sense of it across aggregate con consumers and therefore get to those insights faster is is the hard part as well and so that's what we help with too so can you give us an example just of that because i imagine you know big food and beverage companies maybe you know technology hardware you know with consumer products uh, suppliers like you know, smartphone providers and, and uh, manufacturers and yep. so on what would be an example of particularly of the um i think those use cases would be pretty obvious to people given the technology you're using but on the insight side like what would be an example of when you're when you're aggregating this data let's just say i've you know i've got fifty thousand videos now coming through uh because we've done this at scale what kind of intelligence are you able to give me from those 50,000 videos using the way that you built your platform from an AI perspective? Yeah, you know, it's just a, from the industry perspective, yes, we do work with, you know, things like consumer goods, like cleaning products, household products, food and beverage, tech, uh, pharma as well. But mm -hmm. in terms of the insights now, we aren't necessarily doing 50,000 videos, right? Like, so that's something where we are doing, you know, anywhere between as little as, you know, 15 to as many as a few okay. hundred. Um, yeah. But it's still, again, very, very deep video. And therefore, you only need, mm. you know, that kind of range, again, depending on the project and Got specifics. Yeah. You don't need necessarily thousands. Now, of course, we're doing thousands mm. when you combine everything. But on an individual project, yes. you know, the typical range is like 15 to 300, let's say. Okay. Um, and in terms of how we help them analyze that data is we do a variety of things, right? So on first end, we transcribe everything. And this is across 120 different languages. Uh, if it's a different language other than English, we'll translate it as well. But now once we have that transcription of the audio and the translation, if need be, we do things uh, like NLP, right? Being able to actually automatically detect appropriate keywords and themes, depending on what was said, make it very easily to find those things. So for example, let's say food and beverage, if somebody said the word healthy, you can click on the word healthy and it will show you all the moments within that person's video or videos or the entire group of consumers or the participants, we call them in that project to very quickly find the moments that people are talking about healthy. We'll do sentiment and emotions to help you understand how they think about healthy food, for example. Mm. You will have object and scene recognition if you were doing something in the store. If you just want to go directly to the shelf, you click on the shelf object, it goes directly to the shelf. And so it's all about making it faster and easier to find the moments that matter. Yeah. What we don't do since we're a software company is we don't actually analyze. We mm. help as an assistant to help our end client analyze because at the end yes. of the day, they are the expert on the brand. We yeah. give them all the information, make it really easy to find all those moments um, and then help them, you know, make those conclusions, but also present them because we have a whole presentation builder in the platform that helps them tell powerful stories. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's such a... Um... It's such an interesting field. Like I, I love what you're doing, and I, I'm keen to see some uh, see some examples. Uh, you've got about sixty five people in the in the business, or am I, have I got yep. that right? About right? Yep, yep. about sixty five. Sixty five right and yep. growing. Okay, that's awesome. So you're really you're really getting some momentum now. Can I before we talk about now and what's coming in the future? Can you take me back to the origins? Like what led you to start the business of Giorama, and then and then why did that evolve into Qualsites? Yeah, it was, it's quite a crazy journey, honestly. I mean, I quit uh, Microsoft in 2012 uh, to, you know, start this travel company called Jirama, hence the name. It was, all, it was a play on the word panorama in the world. Um, and uh, I was just very passionate about travel, still am. And the whole uh, concept was how do you help people better plan their trips? And while there was a whole bunch of competition in that space, nobody was really helping you find where to go at the time. And so the initial thing was the recommendation engine. TripAdvisor is great when you know where you want to go and you want to find things to do. 
we were one step before that, which really the competitor was Google, right? Like where you're searching and coming back mm. and searching and coming back and asking friends and all this stuff. And so it was a recommendation engine. And so we started that way. Uh, B2C, we had a couple hundred thousand users and everything, but we make it finding it really hard to make money because uh, when you, in, in, unless you have a huge scale and you have some advertising revenue, the real way you make money in travel typically is bookings. And for mm. bookings, we were a new startup and, you know, it's a commodity right now. You've got all the, you know, mm. you've got the kayaks of the world and all these big players spending billions of dollars on advertising. And so, it's you're not beating them on price, you're matching them on price. And if somebody has a new startup versus an Expedia, like they're going to pick Expedia because of the support and the mm. brand and all that stuff. And so mm. we realized um, a couple of years, like, hey, this is going to be really hard to make money on. Let's pivot. And our first pivot or shift was essentially um, into uh, you know virtual travel. It was actually a very novel idea. It's something that um, you know it was pre Periscope, pre Facebook Live, Mirror, all of the live stuff. Of course, there's so much live stuff now, but this was all rather about live about you it was live the other way live about the world uh basically allowing you to see the world through somebody else's eyes a mm -hmm. local who's in there or a traveler who's passing by uh allowing the world like you and me happen to be privileged people to be able to see and travel out of the world but there's a whole bunch of folks there a vast majority in fact of the population that cannot do that or cannot do that as often and our goal was to help them see more of the world and understand more of the world and so it was a really interesting idea really first of its kind and that was an exciting foray. Uh, did that again? Found it hard to kind of make money, so we decided, okay, let's do B two B. You know, we started to work with tourism organizations and decided there were so many other use cases because anytime somebody wanted to be somebody somewhere but couldn't go there physically, whether it's because of financial, logistical, or, or even sometimes physical reasons, we were there. And so we worked with not just tourism um, you know, organizations, we worked with museums, for example, for virtual field trips with uh, kids in a classroom going to museums. We worked with NASA. Uh, they used us for virtual field trips, for example. We worked on college campus tours, and we were kind of all over the place with a wide variety of use cases, like even site inspections to help people, you know, inspect a facility remotely. Um, and while all that was great and we started to make some money finally, it was one of those things where we were trying to be jack of all trades, and we didn't really uh, essentially, you know, we weren't kind of seeing great growth. It was just kind of up and down and up and down, mm -hmm. and each uh, industry had its own sales nuance and things like that. And that's where we said, you know, uh, we really got to ought to kind of go deep into one vertical. And that's where we made the decision to really kind of focus on one. We tested a whole bunch. Uh, and that's how we pivoted, uh, where we found uh, that our technology, we did insight. The funny part is we did research and insights to find that the insights world was where <laughs> our, uh, our uh, technology was most valuable. And that, you know, there were clients ready to pay money and there was a real pain point we're solving. Um, yeah. So that's how it all happened. That, well, you know, I love that story because I reckon probably so far, I'd say at least 40 or 50% of founders have had the biggest, you know, the, the last, you know, three to five years where they've had the biggest shift in growth has all come following a massive consolidation of focus and effort into a single industry or vertical or customer type mm -hmm. where they've gone either this is a mass market where there's a lot of people who can spend a small amount of money or it's actually a market where there's a small amount of customers but they've got a lot of money to spend and we can really far more deeply solve that problem in a way that nobody else can and exactly. each time that has occurred and these you know some of these businesses have already got to you know 40 50 80 million and then gone we're still trying to be everything to everyone and this this, this isn't working we're really distracted and we've got focuses everywhere and we can't be expert at everything and they kind of shift right back down and uh, mm -hmm. I can think of so many examples on the podcast so far where that's happened. And I think that's really, I think it's a really insightful thing. But you know, when you're when you're growing, you're when you're starting up and you're trying to find your product market fit, you you have to test all this stuff, right? Like you're going, oh, there's exactly. an opportunity, go after that. There's a customer said, you know, I need this. Okay, give them that, and you end yeah, up with all so of this signals, stuff. You know? right? And you're getting pulled so many directions, and you're so yeah. passionate about it, like, oh yeah, let's try this, let's try yeah. that, let's do this. Uh, but in all that bargain, I mean, as long as you keep on learning. But at the time, you know, you're in the weeds mm. of it, and. It's hard to kind of really come out and be like, wait, what's working? What's not working? What's mm -hmm. actually seeing? Uh, but it was it was an interesting journey. It was a long journey, uh, but I'm glad we stayed persistent and uh, we're here today where we're finally seeing a great amount of growth. That's awesome. Uh, brilliant, mate. Thank you very much for that uh, summary. So I've got some questions for you. One of, the, one of the things I'd really love to understand is actually the, the couple of things, maybe if you were to think of, you know, maybe one or two moments where you either adopted and so maybe it was that shift, that kind of, you know, focus on a really key um, customer type or, or segment or other things in the business that really, that you notice really changed the trajectory 
on growth because you know you had a business that you were working through a whole bunch of stuff over time and now you've got 65 people and the business is growing fast what were some of the things that you that you would consider key moments or key decisions or key strategies that you put in place that really changed the trajectory on your growth yeah you know the first was coming to the realization that you know we were trying to be everything to everybody and we realized like hey this is not working there's so many nuances in each of these industries we really ought to kind of go deep in one. So it was that mm -hmm. kind of realization that we were trying to do too much and we really had to focus and go deeper rather than broad and yeah. narrow. But the second was we decided to actually apply for an incubator uh, or accelerator, 500 startups out of the valley. Uh -huh. uh, we used that program and you know, we got into the program um, and we used that program very diligently while many of the startups were earlier than us in that they were fairly newer and they were trying to figure out a lot of things. For us, we had kind of built great tech and we were trying to figure out the right industry. And so uh, using that program, we tested, I think it was seven different verticals and using the tools that they shared and the techniques that they showed us around, even just sales techniques, we used those sales techniques almost as a you know market potential technique using things like email automation to kind of go out and send messages to the seven different industries and basically A-B test mm -hmm. all of them uh, to figure out where our, where is our message resonating. And it, that was one clear signal where we were saying, wow, insights is like people are responding much more. We're getting, you know, much, mm -hmm. many more bites, many more responses. And then, of course, had industry conversations with experts and things like that to further validate those. And I think it was that process of a few months where we really kind of diligently tried to find a market versus previously where we were just kind of getting pulled in different directions and mm. either having an idea and trying to pursue it or having a client come to a website and kind of be a new industry and us getting excited and just going after it. This was a much more focused and organized process that then led to our pivot uh, to insights and right. the rest. Of and so to test those industries, were you using, um, were you having to essentially buy lists and then um, and do email marketing automation from that to then measure results? Is that how you sort of found that they got access to the data? Basically, yeah, there was actually another fellow 500 startups company called Growbots. Uh, and it was one of the tools that was taught to us basically as part of the whole email sequencing and sales automation type of uh, techniques. And they gave, you know, I guess, uh, s s steep discounts to fellow 500 startups. So we're like, great, we're going to use Growbots. And I think the interesting thing about the tool at the time was that it not only had the email you know, automation piece where you could, you know, schedule emails and have sequences and all of that, but it also had the databases in there. So it was very easy to kind of search nice. for and kind of, Get them in, and so the database was part of that tool, and we just kind of honed in on that tool and uh, tested the heck out of it and fully utilized it. Awesome, love that. What about funding? Um, you know, it's a conversation that you know, you know, every and every founder who's never done any kind of funding before, it's like, oh my god, the world, like the number of funding options. Uh, you know, there'll be a, a, a podcast uh, published soon, or maybe uh, already published by the time this one um, goes live with Robbie Sharon Zipser from High Pages, where we actually unpacked pretty much every kind of debt structure and equity structure you can think of that they've used and they've used pretty much all of them to raise different kinds of capital. How did you approach uh -huh. funding through this uh, journey? What were the different kinds of funding that you considered or undertook um, that got you to where you are today? Yeah, so we start off with friends and family, which mm -hmm. tends to be, you know, um, quite common around. And initially it was me, right? So I self-funded for a couple of years, used all my savings and money from Microsoft that I made to kind of uh, to kind of put into the business. But once I was running out of that, the next was friends and family, and that's what allowed me to kind of really um, start and get a couple more people and, you know, just mm -hmm. start to kind of really work towards it further. Uh, beyond that, then we start to really, uh, once we had our first, once we built the product, right? So this was all pre-product while we were still building just yeah. with kind of an idea and some early, early, like basic product. As we got the product in the market, it was something where we had, even this was in the early, like the travel planning product, it was a very sound product. Our tech has always been great. And so that's where we used, in fact, we were lucky to be a part of this, uh, uh, ex like sort of an incubator space called 1871, a co-working space, but also an incubator. It's like uh, one of the, the, like the startup, it at least used to be the startup hub in Chicago. Now, of course, there's several, mm -hmm. uh, but we were one of the first 10 startups to be part of that hub. And they were interesting in that they help you connect with, they connected schools, startups, and investors in the same thing. And they had all kinds of workshops. And so not only would we learn, but we also made a whole bunch of connections. So my first couple of angel investors that were like legit angel investors came from connections at 1871. Right. And then of course, those helped me introduce to others and so on. And so that was an angel funding. Uh, we still haven't done venture. It's something actually we will probably go for later this year. So we're gearing up for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've done angel uh, financing, including some some funds like 500 startups or 
other small funds as well as family offices and things like that. Yeah. But we haven't gone full blown institutional yet. We were purposefully a we weren't ready for a few years, and now mm-hmm. that we've been ready, we've been waiting for the right time, and I believe this year will be that right time. For those who haven't, uh, who in the community may not have, um, don't understand what angel investing sort of looks like. You know, typically, you know, sort of check size. What do they want for that? How do they get their money back out? You know, like what's how how does that work? Yeah, so it's been interesting. I mean, um, there's obviously many different ways and many different documents one can use, right? Um, uh, right now, I mean, safes are pretty pretty common when you're doing it early. Back when we were doing this, uh, there was no safe yet. It was the precursor to safe that we used, which was safe like, uh, but not a convertible note in that it was not debt, but it was convertible. And that tends to be when you're early on, it tends to be the easiest way to raise money so that you're not pricing because it's hard, right? When you're really early, when you have an idea, maybe some product, not much traction, it's hard to put a value on the company, right? You mm. may think it's one thing, investors may think it's other. And so therefore the best way typically to do this is to actually have a convertible sort of instrument. You know, one of course is convertible debt. The other one is convertible equity, whether it's safe or whatever else. Um, convertible debt, um, you know, is something I stayed away from because then you know, that's debt on the books and there's other, you know, potential issues with that down the road um, versus convertible equity or safes on the other hand are more um, t- typically tend to be more uh, you know, entrepreneur friendly mm-hmm. uh, yet, you know, very investor, you know, uh, fair as well. And so what those do typically is they allow you to set a valuation cap and okay. that valuation cap is something that um, you can tend to agree on. It's still, of course, a negotiation, but when you agree on that cap, you also have with it a discount. And so the way it works is that when we raise our real VC round, let's say, that's what we call you know, qualified financing, um, then you will convert either the cap. So let's say if that cap was 5 million, but your actual you know, round was at a 20 million valuation, these angel investors get that value being capped at 5 million, even right. though you grow to 20. Yeah. But if let's say the VC comes in and that qualified financing comes in at 5 million, the angel investors get a 20% or whatever the percent is discount. that is decided is, is discount. And so that's where they get the better off the valuation cap or the discount. Yeah. That tends to be a much easier sell to investors because right. they're guaranteed a 20% discount on the next investor yep. and or that max cap. And this way, you don't have Got to it. really too much go too deep into the valuation conversation. You can defer that for later. And are they usually expecting some kind of interest um, to be accrued over the over the course? So, you know, fundamentally, they're providing you cash now that you can use to fund the business. That cash can be converted to equity at the time. You know, what what was the sort of the typical note terms? Were these like two thing, two years, or? Three years or? Yeah, so that's if you go with the note. And that's why we didn't go with the note. So oh, if you okay. do go with the note, there tends to be interest and yeah. all of that. Um, if you don't but go with the note and you go with convertible equity instead, it's not something that accrues no, interest, accrues. but of course has the ability to, to convert, um, you know, at either the, uh, you know, qualified financing date or at the mm. maturity date at the investor's option. And so this way it gives them the option to convert, uh, you know, in two years uh, or to wait for the venture round so that they convert it to the preferred round uh, with the venture investor. So it gives them both those options. Got it. Very nice. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate that. Um, What about team? How have you gone about, uh, you know, given you've made some strategic shifts in the business, how did you think about, uh, particularly since it sounded like it was maybe sort of 28, was it 2018 that was probably the most, um, was that where the the real double down occurred in in terms of the single vertical focus? Yeah, 2018 was when we made a hard switch into insights. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, 2020 was our breakout year uh, mm-hmm. of growth, but 2018 was that hard switch, kind of starting from scratch in terms yeah. of brand new industry, zero revenue, mm. uh, but um, you know, kind of having some product that we could bring, and then of course building a whole bunch more. Bunch more. So now that you know, and you've now passed that. Uh, you know, typically founders. Um, there tends to be some comfort wobbles depending on their background and their experience in it from a leadership perspective. You, usually around the you know, 20, 30 people mark where all of a sudden they realize actually they can't talk to everybody every day. They can't manage everybody else's yeah. priorities. They're going to have to start building some you know, management capability, bringing in some more senior people, et cetera. And that 20 to 30 is usually where it starts to get a bit painful if they haven't already started that process. How did you, th- yeah. in between sort of 2018 and now, how did you think about building your team in terms of the sort of sequencing of hires to to get you something that was manageable so you can still focus on the stuff that you're good at and the stuff that you're strong in, the stuff that you enjoy, um, but other people are helping to kind of you know, bring everyone else along. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. You know, I was just joking with one of my colleagues the other day. It was like, you know, we recently hired someone. I've never even, it's, not, it's been a month, I've never even spoken to them. It's kind of nuts, right? It just, 
it, it's because it's all, all happened so fast. So yeah. to like just to have that is so strange for me because I was interviewing every person, mm -hmm. talking to every person. And obviously that's changed uh, in the last couple of years. Now, um, you know, back in 2018, we only had, what was it, uh, probably, you know, 15 uh, people of which many were like, probably like three employees and, you know, 12 contractors type of thing, right? It was, it was like quite, uh, quite a little bit. Um, and then um, 2018, as we kind of grew in 2019 was the year we kind of started to find our stride. That's when we started to add some folks. Initially, we've always been tech heavy, by the way. So we were always like from those 15, 12 were tech, three were, you know, some mm. sort of myself included, and then some customer support and maybe some basic sales and marketing, right? Uh, but as we started to grow, it was really in 2020, in fact. So it's quite late, 2019 as well, we kind of wrote it that way. 2020 was the year we started to grow. So in the last year and a half, we have tripled basically our, um, our headcount. Uh, but in 2020 was when we realized, okay, hey, we really need some additional management help. And I was really fortunate to find uh, back then it was our head of operations, but now she's our COO, Courtney Williams, and similar with Jared Carr, who back then was you know head of customer strategy, now is our chief customer officer. Um, in two key additional hires that really really helped you know a take off work out of my plate, uh, b kind of do their shit much better than I could do it because mm -hmm. that was their expertise, mm -hmm. and then c help grow that team under them and help manage that team and cultivate that team, and so. I think the key, and I'd done that on tech. So on tech, mm. I had my C2 had helped me build the tech side of this because mm. we were always heavy on tech. Mm. But on the business side is where, because we were tech first always, is where we were kind of lagging behind. And having those key additional hires uh, was uh, was essential uh, to kind of help us grow and help us do it right. That's awesome. And so uh, it sounded like those people, so you know, if you think about some of your, the customer, um, you know, maybe the customer success side or the sales and marketing side, did you build the, the people who are doing the work first or did you get this more senior people first and have them build their team from scratch so it's interesting we had one or two people initially that were yeah. doing the work so it was me and one more guy kyle mm. on our team who's still of course here and he's one of our key folks uh but it was just two of us and we hit a million in revenue and it was two of us <laughs> um and so it was it was we, we were kind of doing a lot uh, but then, of course, that's when we added, uh, I think initially it was a couple more project managers. And then right after that mm -hmm. was where we realized, OK, hey, no, 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 we really need someone who's much more senior to help manage this team and grow this team. Yeah. And so it was a little bit of both where we didn't go too much into, you know, there was not many people hired before we had the yeah. senior person. It was a couple. And then we kind of added the, the senior team. And one of the, I think the key things um, we've done team wise and you know, talking about team is kind of really the way we hire has been uh, focused not just, of course, in expertise and background and things like that, but really on team fit. You know, I think that's the one thing, knock on wood, we've actually done really, really well. We have a team that is super collaborative and super, like, just good humans, first and foremost, people that are really passionate about what we're doing, really bought into our vision, and therefore, um, just the, the camaraderie, even in a COVID-type time, we've, there's so many people that, you know, I didn't meet until our summit just a couple months ago for, like, a whole year of them being, mm. and they didn't meet anyone else because we're all virtual. But just the camaraderie we've been able to build by kind of picking the right people beyond just looking at skill, mm. um, I think has been a, is a key advantage uh, to our team. That's, uh, yeah, well, number one, I love that. And, you know, the whole concept of fit is a really interesting one because, uh, you know, I think people can get lost in that principle. Sometimes people take it as, well, if they're not like us, then we won't take them on because that means they don't fit. And I kind of always think, well, if you want your culture to stay exactly the same as those people are, then that's one thing. But theoretically, it's you know I'm always wondering what can this person do to bring to our culture to help it evolve, as opposed to have to fit it into the box that may already exist. Otherwise, the organization doesn't evolve. But on the flip side, exactly. like I know, um, uh, you know, Flight Center have a uh, a very strong, uh, very you know, big travel, you know, big travel agency, global travel agency, but very big in Australia, who have a very sort of you know fit in or you know walk out the door um, style of culture and it's very strong mm -hmm. um, culturally but people are like well you, you're either in this or you're not and if you don't like everything right. that we do see you later it's a very interesting scenario so how but I'm interested in then how practically you know because what, there's one thing is once the person's in the business seeing how they gel with the team and how the relationships develop and all the rest but you know fundamentally you've got to screen for that in your hiring process so what are some of the you know what, yeah. what are a couple of the practical things that you found the most impactful in helping you assess whether you think they're going to be a good fit for the organization or not you know honestly it's been gut, gut. it's yeah. been a lot of gut it's been just having that conversation like of course when they come to, for the interview with me as pretty much typically the final interview 
they've already been vetted out in terms of they have the skill, they have mm. the expertise yeah. and those kinds of things. Um, but really my key thing, I, I'm not grilling somebody in my interviews. Mm. It's really having a conversation and kind of just getting a real feel yeah. for who they are. Mm. Um, you know, talking about those two different examples you said before, I think us is a, a balance in that, you know, on one end we want people to fit, but not fit as in a certain, we, we have a very diverse team, you know, multinational mm. in multiple, like four countries at this point, a very diverse team in terms of demographics and geographics and all of that and ages as well. And, uh, but the whole thing is really key values, right? So mm. looking for key values without, of course, asking for them mm. or, um, you know, saying them out loud, but really curiosity, right? Being one of the key mm. ones for us and uh, things like how passionate they are, they are uh, how just really honest and transparent they are, you know, how willing to learn they are. Mm. Those are the kinds of things that if you can find people who have a few of those and some others that we look for qualities, mm. then that is the fit That's right. across the team. And the because art. you have that. And then, of course, they can be very, very diverse in many other ways and help grow the culture, mm. but have that one constant, like, yeah. you know, that same ethos, basically. I find that, you know, the art in that is really having thought about your questions that help you get somebody talking about something in the right way so to your point you're not going to go okay one of our uh, one of our values is passion um are you passionate <laughs> yes i am okay great next question is like that didn't tell me anything <laughs> so it's like yeah, how do exactly, i get them talking exactly. about something that's going to help me you know assess that it's a really it's an interesting uh, yeah. art form and it's kind of funny right when i was doing this early on like now we of course we've grown up and over the last year we have like brand book and brand values and all this good stuff that's been built um, so there's a lot of stuff to reference from, but earlier it was just really, literally heart, gut, you know, and just conversations, just kind of trying to feel somebody out. It worked more, more like most times it worked. Yeah, have we got sometimes a couple of things wrong? Yes, but for the most time it worked just because we, I mean, A, got lucky as well, and B, just, you know, managed to kind of find that. But then as we've grown, yes, having those values, understanding what kinds of questions to ask has kind of allowed not just me, but other folks who are now hiring completely without me um, to be able to actually you know, still screen and look for that mm. and do that in a genuine way. How have you thought about your value proposition? You, I mean, if you think about, you know, you obviously from a customer perspective, you know, matching your, you know, your core value proposition, you know, you're getting really clear on insights and who the customers are going to be for that. But once you're in that game and, you know, it's, you're getting traction and it's moving fast, how, how do you stay on top of making sure that you are delivering enough value and you're thinking about your market and how you continue to sort of differentiate and add so that you've got a sort of sustainable competitive advantage. How much time do you think you spend focused on competitors versus just customer problems in terms of the way that it evolves? How do you, how do you stay on top of that when the business is growing quickly? So this is one thing that I am really proud about, you know, what, like how we do it. We are really, really focused on innovation. We're always focused on what's next. We are always building the next thing while we're still supporting and improving the current thing. And that's why we've been tech heavy. It's been allowed, it's allowed us to do that, mm. to be able to have enough of a team and a very, very strong team at that who now have worked together, you know, nine years, many of them, we've been uh, very, very low on attrition, which is great. That really has basically allowed us to have this team that's going laser fast building thing. We're, we're pushing stuff multiple times a week. Mm. Um, and so we're really, really fast paced in terms of innovation. Uh, I don't, and, you know, in the past, I used to wonder, you know, should I look at competitors? I've kind of found that when, even when I came into insights, I'm not an insight, I'm not a researcher, but I've been told many times like, oh, you must have been a researcher. And it's not, it's just, I'm a good listener. Mm -hmm. Right. I'll, I'll kind of go into those rooms. I'll kind of be a fly on the wall. I'll listen. I'll ask the questions and just learn about somebody's process and problems and things like that. And we basically take that kind of data and we put that, I'm basically the head of product still. And mm -hmm. I keep product really close. I'm a very mm -hmm. product heavy CEO. And so we are always looking at what's ahead. And that's really where we've managed to, when we came into Insights, we came in with this live video technology to help you remotely do ethnography. It was great. People were like, wow, when they saw it. But what we realized was it was very niche. It was something that was full, so far ahead about what they were mm. doing. It was A, too early to the market. And B, it was a fraction, it was a niche. It was only a fraction of projects that could even use something like that. Yeah. Where we really got into our stride was we realized that once we analyzed the market, we we're saying, hey, on Quant, you've got the big players like the Survey Monkeys and the Qualtrics, mm. but in Qual, there's no clear leader. Mm. There's a bunch of startups like us mm. doing niche different things. But what if we actually went in and tried, just be bold and try to go and kind of capture, be that Qualtrics or Survey Monkey off the quality of the market because there is no clear leader. Mm. And that's where we went broader and we kind of completely changed and expanded our platform both horizontally and vertically to kind of offer those services. And so it's kind of staying in those conversations, learning and just being able to, and this is the this is the hard part, especially you know tech folks as well. Like 
when you build something, you're really proud about it. But we have thrown, I mean, think about our two different pivots before we got here. We've thrown away a, an am amazing amount of tech. That was yeah. all great tech. Mm. It was hard, but I think the team just understanding that we're going to iterate, iterate, iterate until we kind of find that product market fit and then keep going and then keep cannibalizing and reinventing ourselves. Mm. I think that uh, mindset has really kind of helped us do that. And so we do pay close attention to uh, not just uh, our clients, but sometimes we're just doing forefront innovation based on what we have seen and what we know can be next. Mm. Other times, of course, there's, of course, industry reports and trends and things like, yeah. like that we look at as well, but it's a combination of those. I love that. And um, you know, some, of the, some of the themes that I'm hearing you talk about when you think, because a lot of people spend, um, you know, can really fall into the trap of doing things like, just looking at what their competitors are doing and trying to almost sort of match and maybe differentiate on one thing that's small. But fundamentally, if you're if you're sort of out there looking for best practice, i.e. things that people are already doing, then you're always going to be a laggard. You're always going to be behind the game and you're actually just playing catch up. And if you don't have yeah. sufficient differentiation, that's going to be um, that's going to be problematic. But what I like is that you it sounds like you spent a lot more time listening to and interacting with your customers to really figure out what their problems are. And not just taking that as your only lead, because you can also end up in some pretty interesting places if you do that and you're not actually yep. bringing, because you know, yep. sometimes customers don't know what they need until you put it in front of them, right? Because they haven't exactly. seen it before. They didn't even know it's possible to do X, Y, Z. Exactly. So you've got this exactly. interesting... And that's why coming... Take, Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, so you've got this interesting mix of going, here's the strategic sort of canvas, here's a category, right? Here's the, we've got a category role we want to play. And so there is clearly some good, you know, kind of market thinking there about where's a space we can own, where's some white space. But then we've really got to listen to our customers to make sure we're adding enough value in a way that, you know, we're going to be, they're never going to want to let us go. Like once they've got us inside there, we're adding so much value. They're like, okay, this is incredible. And then we've got to mix that with, we've got to bring stuff that's next practice because if we're only looking at what's currently best practice, then we're already behind. That's what everyone else is already doing. That sound like the right kind of exactly. mix for you guys? Absolutely. Mm, oh, 100%, right? And for us, I mean, one thing we've, um, I've always looked at as an advantage is actually not being from, whether it was the travel industry, mm. virtual travel was just a whole new industry. Nobody was ever part of it. And then we created it basically. And then this industry, both these industries, travel and insights, we weren't, at least I wasn't in them. And I think that was an advantage because when I came in, I didn't know, you know, if I was a researcher or if I was a travel executive, I would have kind of had all of those biases on what, you know, one thinks subconsciously or consciously can't be done, mm. right? Versus here, you just go and see, okay, these seem to be the problems. You kind of analyze it. I never looked at any competitors and said, based on this, here's what I think we should do. We build that out, start to build out get feedback and then look and see, okay, are there the competitors around there? Mm. Um, and typically we were finding like, no, we had actually gone way past what people were doing because otherwise people were just stay getting mm. stuck in some of those boxes mm. while we didn't really know what was not possible. So we went out and built things that were much ahead of the game and it's happened multiple times for us. And so we hope to kind of keep doing that over the years. Love that. What about, can I um, shift, uh, I guess, out of the sort of practicalities of business and, and come to you? What what makes you come alive in business and how does that tend to show up in your company? Um, comes alive more, more just in, in terms of passion or yeah. Uh, what, yeah. What, what, kinda... yeah, when you think about the stuff that really lights a fire in you business wise that continues to make you get out of bed every mm -hmm. day and bring energy to the business. Yeah. And fundamentally, even in a company of 65 people, yes, you've now got some management structure in place, but the energy comes from the founder and I, you know, uh, fundamentally, the CEO probably gets two bad days a year, right? Like you, you can, you can have, a, you can. Everyone's <laughs> entitled to a few bad days, but when you're the, when you're the leader and you're also the leader of someone who's trying to inspire, you, you actually have to bring your energy. And in the absence of something that lights your fire, that energy tends to sort of wane or wither, or it's hard to give to other people. What what lights you up? For me, it's it's always been the the innovation side of it, right? Mm -hmm. It's the product side of it. As I mentioned, like that's my passion. That's my forte. Um, that's what I still do, you know, every single day in some way, shape or form uh, as a big part of my day. Um, and I think just being able to make an impact, it sounds cheesy, but it's true. It's, it's, that's what's driven me all the time. It's just being able to actually make an impact, build something that truly, you know, is something and does something, mm -hmm. you know, in the world. And like, that's like the core underlying thing I've always had. And then in this case, we actually truly like by having a platform that helps several companies and agencies and others truly better understand humankind or human behavior to then help them build better products and services mm -hmm. actually does have a large impact indirectly, but does have a large impact on the world. Um, and therefore, you know, that's really a big driving force for us is like, what can we do to, you know, help everybody else? Like 
product, it's kind of interesting if you think about it, it's like product innovation that we do to help others do product innovation mm. and therefore help, <laughs> you know, just everyone be more innovative, right? Yeah. If we do things right and, you know, provide them the right tools and all of that. And so that's really what exciting because I'm all about uh, yeah. innovation and new technology. What I, um, one of the things I'd really like to draw out of what you've just said for our audience is uh, well, I've just built a, I've just built a new diagnostic to help companies of, you know, typically anywhere probably from, you know, five to maybe a hundred people who are still scaling and are trying to figure actually how, how their scaling practices and how the things they've built in the business compare to the businesses that actually scale the best mm-hmm. and the practices that they have. So I've built this diagnostic tool that allows people to, in a seven minute survey to actually get a report back that says, here's where your gaps are. Here's where right. you're really strong. The first section of these nine, um, sort of business pillars that are in there is actually founder awareness and founder health. And two of the elements that I mm-hmm. that I talk about in there were two of the element two of the key practices are actually two things you've just drawn on. First of all, the founder understands what gives them energy, and they actively and proactively talent pool and identify talent to fill those things that actually to ensure that they don't end up spending time on things to take energy away from them. And you are clearly, mm-hmm. you know, you you know that about yourself that what lights you up is product, and so you've built this leadership team in a way that allows you to spend the time not only adding the space that you get the most value, that you can add the most value, but also the place that gives you energy. Because in the absence of that, if the founder loses energy, say goodbye to the business pretty shortly exactly. after, you know what I mean? That's going to have, it's going to become a big problem. Um, so, Absolutely. and the second part is actually founders who have enough why in their personal purpose, their personal why and motivation that that is going to sustain them in the hard times. Because in the absence of that desire to actually really create impact, when it's just about money, when hard times come, founders make very different decisions if they're not actually motivated by something deeper than financial because they look at the business and go, oh, the business is starting to wither. Maybe I should just sell it off. Like, let's get the money out and you know, just put this thing to bed as opposed to going, now it's time to double down. Actually, maybe it's time to double our investment in this business because I know that there's a next horizon. But they do that because they've got a much bigger why uh, beyond just the money. Exactly, exactly. It's just, it's that it's been that driving force that we've had, I mean, you know, being around for nine years, most of which where we were struggling, mm-hmm. right, is the, is the honest truth, uh, being still, you know, being able to come back and still kind of go at it and still kind of just have that energy has been a key kind of, I think, advantage or or at least, I think, persist. Like when I, when I, if somebody asked me, you know, what are the things that you guys did that, you know, thought that got you here? I say it's three things. It's passion, persistence, and the ability to pivot, right, mm-hmm. and uh, to be kind of reinventing yourself. Um, has been those things and because we've had times where we've been down to I mean three times we've been down to the last five thousand dollars or less in our bank mm-hmm. account right and those are the times and other times even when launching and you know first couple of years my parents being like hey what are you doing you had a cushy job like this is a mistake you know didn't want sometimes mm-hmm. initially they didn't want me to launch uh, nice. launched you know was like hey you know we, we love you and we'll support you but uh Really, we think you're making the wrong decision, and it's times like that where if you really have that commitment and you really have that belief. Now, you obviously shouldn't have it completely wrongly. We we knew that we were onto something. We just didn't have the right industry. We knew we had great tech, and we always had so much validation from some phenomenal people. Yeah. Uh, yes, we weren't seeing revenue traction, but that was that was the thing that took us a while to kind of get that product market fit to get to revenue traction. Um, but it was having those whys and having that driving force. Um, is what allows us to kind of wither all those storms and be where we are today. Beautiful. So good. So good. Um, biggest mistake you've made in business to date and what did you learn from it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, if I mean, we've made many mistakes, so I don't know if there's one like biggest one I can like single out, but I, I can perhaps talk about a couple, right? One is... Um, when we were first launching, right, the first time, again, because I'm so into product, when we were first launching, I think we took like a year, year and a half just to launch our product in the market because I was like a perfectionist, like, no, 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 this has got to be like A++, A++ mm-hmm. you know. Um, but uh, in doing that, we had, ironically, that year was, I guess, the year of travel planning, 2012. I don't know what happened. It was a plethora of startups that kind of came to the market. No one doing exactly what we did, but there were, of course, overlapping startups. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, we just waited too long to get out of the gates. We would have perhaps kind of got out sooner, maybe be able to raise money sooner, do other things and sort of capture more markets. So that was one, you know, starting off the blocks kind of mistake that then we decided never to repeat again rather than to try and like perfect the technology and launch it. Let's launch and iterate, launch and iterate, like just keep iterating, iterating. And so that's where we, we fix that. And other time is sometimes, you know, you just have like, we waited too long um, to make now, again, if I had to do things over, right? There's a lot of mm. things I wouldn't do over because, 
if we didn't do those things, we wouldn't kind of be here yeah. today. But at the same time, I wish I could condense those nine years into some shorter years. And I think part of that was to be more diligent around the industry, right? When we mm -hmm. kind of had this great virtual travel technology, for example, after that first pivot, um, it was really exciting technology, one of its kind. But uh, it was something that we were trying to go to education and to governments and all of this stuff. And we weren't thinking too hard about the business side and the sales process and the, the fact that some of these, you know, while they may have, some of them don't have money, right? But some of them have money, but it's such long sales cycles. And so we didn't pay enough. It. We paid attention to the value on paper of the use case, but didn't really pay enough attention to the feasibility of the sales cycle and the nuance of all of the different kind of facets of kind of getting in the door and being able to scale that quickly and so on. And that's where we faltered, where, of course, eventually we kind of learned and we did the right tests while we're part of 500 startups to kind of find the right market. I wish we had done that sooner because we would have kind of condensed the time to get mm -hmm. here. Um, so I'd say those are a couple of ones that come yeah. to mind. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, really interesting. You know, everything's easy in in hindsight, right? You know, it's great to have a twenty twenty vision, but <laughs> fundamentally, you get the learnings from somewhere. Hopefully, you can contract those by using good advisors and you know, having a good peer network and and listening to podcasts and you know whatever else your sort of source of um, learnings is. But uh, some things can be truncated, Absolutely. and some things we just got to go through because you know it's just the way it works, right? Yep. So, uh, two questions more for you. If you, we've talked a lot about how we've got to here today, but if you go out three years from now, what's the business going to look like in your mind? It's actually going to be very different, very different. Like as I mentioned, you know, we're always reinventing and something we're currently in stealth about, but it is something that we later this year plan to kind of really kind of go big with. Um, and it's something that we think is really going to revolutionize the industry. Of course, everybody says mm -hmm. that, but it's something that we have really been working on uh, behind the scenes for a while. Uh, it's something that um, is kind of creating a new category that didn't exist. Uh, it's something that we've learned from, of course, doing all the work we've done. And it's, again, one of those forward thinking mm -hmm. things. But uh, it will kind of change, in fact, uh, really kind of really shake up what we're doing, but in, a, in, a, in, in the right way. And we, we've kind of really seen the data to kind of know this is it. And we've got the right advisors, people who've been there, done that in the industry that are really kind of behind this. And these are folks that, you know, um, I remember one of them uh, who actually is uh, like I call him the godfather of the industry and uh, he's been with us, you know, for a couple of years and he's shut down a lot of my ideas. Right. Uh, and uh, but this one, uh, he was like, wow. And like getting that from him was even, was more exciting than our first month yeah. <laughs> because like he is the godfather. That's and so awesome. that's the we are really bullish about what I, I'm unfortunately I'm not able course, to talk yeah. about it yet, but. Uh, it's something that, yeah, it will change. And it's something that I believe is going to allow us, right, um, to have an even faster rate of growth mm -hmm. because of just the way the, 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 just the fundamentals of the business yeah. are. It becomes more, even more sticky SaaS and things like that. So it's, it's really exciting all across, but unfortunately. And I love that that absolutely. is uh, category creation rather than kind of uh, category leadership, you know, like, well, creating a new one. So, uh, yeah, beautiful. And, you know, have any companies um, that are ca capable of do it, given the, what you've been through in the last, you know, couple of major shifts, I'm sure you guys are really well set up to do that. So that's very exciting. Uh, last question I have for you, which I ask every founder is, um, I want you to imagine, uh, is a little segment I call above all else. And so I want you to imagine that you are, um, you're in your yearning years. So, uh, you know, you've, you've still got a long way to go before you get to your yearning years. You've obviously got lots of energy and you've got a lot of uh, stuff you want to achieve. But let's imagine you're in the sort of later years of life. You've got lots of, you know, you've got your full mind. You've got all this, you know, you, you've built as many businesses as you wanted. You've solved all the problems that you felt like you had the, um, the appetite to solve. And the CEO of the world's largest global community of first-time founders, you know, typically those sort of maybe one to 20 million um, founders, but they haven't done it before and they're super hungry and they want the wisdom. And she gives you you just like this one-time opportunity where she goes okay now you have to crystallize for me above all else what are the three things that a founder needs to get right if they want to truly scale what would be those three things for you i mean i'm biased because this is something that we've kind of used and i, I would strongly believe in uh but uh it's something where and it's not necessarily for scale per se, but it's to succeed, I believe, right? So one is just be truly, truly passionate, right? It goes back to what you were saying earlier, having those why, having that driving force. So if you're really passionate about what you're doing or the problem you're solving, that is a very key thing you need, especially as an early stage mm -hmm. founder that's going to go through all these ups and downs, be able to wither those and to kind of really stay hungry, right? So that's one. Uh, persistence. 
um, is the other thing, right? You are going to hit so many walls, so many twists and turns, and really staying persistent through all of that is key. Again, not being foolishly persistent, yeah. right? Being persistent when it, when it, and being able to, and that's why the third one, these all kind of go so hand in hand is again, the, the ability to pivot because being able to actually kind of, I mean, no, I mean, it's rare, right? It's rare. There's many businesses today that I'm sure are there's so many case studies out there where people started with one mm-hmm. thing and just ended up either completely different. Mm-hmm. We have one example of that, but sometimes, you know, significantly, even within the realm of what they yeah. were doing, they start for like one niche thing and then kind of became completely like, you know, there's so many examples of that around the world. And so you know that what you start with is very likely not going to be what you end with. But if you have that open mind, right, the mm-hmm. mind that says, hey, I'm willing to learn, I'm willing to reinvent, uh, and I'm willing to kind of shift and pivot, that I think is another key advantage to be able to kind of really um, stay out there and keep growing. I love that. That is beautiful. And I'd really love to acknowledge you today, Nihal, because those three things I can you can hear if you sort of listen back to this full episode, folks, you'll hear actually all of those three things have played such a major role in how you got here to today. And one of the things I love about the way you've approached this business is that humility, because you can't actually do pivots. Well, you might be persistent and dogged because you want to go after a goal, but that's very easy to sort of to end up actually closed minded and tunnel visioned and not listening and not taking feedback. Sure. And so it's a hard thing or it's like, well, how much feedback do I take? Do I, I can't just be sort of blown around by the wind. So I've got to find this balance between, you know, being persistent and being open. And then, you know, when I've made a shift, now I have to be persistent in that direction. And then I have to be open to another shift. Then I have to be persistent in that direction. It's actually, it's really, <laughs> it's really hard to do. It's a dichotomy, right? But it is, um, it's how great businesses evolve. And the fact that it's taken, you know, a good amount of time for you to go through that learning process because you stayed open. Now you're getting the fruits of that labor. And I don't necessarily mean the financial fruits. You're now having the impact that you want. You're starting to grow, which means you can accelerate your impact. And so having a team of 65 must be super exciting when you look around and you look at your management team and you go, there's all these people here that are smarter than me at the things that they're great at, which allows me to spend more time doing the stuff that I love. Now I know I'm set up for success because I can actually have great ideas and I've got great people who can help me implement them as well. And so that's a very absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's such a great feeling we were just creating you know an exec summary the other day and i was putting on my like leadership slide i was like wow like literally just two days ago i looked back and i was telling my colleague who was working with me on that i was like look at this team i mean like because again everything's happened so quickly mm-hmm. but to have people at you know with that caliber you know by my side you know real experts in all the things they do uh, it's kind of really allowed us to be where we are today. It's going to allow us to kind of grow further. And as you mentioned, it allows me to focus where my strengths are. So exactly. you're absolutely right. Beautiful, Nihal. Uh, Nihal, how can um, people uh, get in touch with you or follow along with what uh, with, with what you or the company are doing? Absolutely. I mean, my, my email is nihal at qualsites.com. Uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, they can follow us on our website, uh, you know, and, and social channels and mm-hmm. things like that. But it's all just... Uh, call sites and uh, I myself am not too big on social but our company is uh, obviously present uh, in the in the standard channels uh, but I'm of course reachable by you know beautiful All right, thank you so much uh, folks I really hope you've enjoyed the show today a uh, huge thanks um, to Nihal uh, really wonderful story and so many learnings for uh, aspiring founders and and uh, first and second time founders and, and professional CEOs who are growing their companies and want to be able to really maximize their their impact uh before you go if you like what you've heard today of course please leave us a review on any of the platforms we love apple Podcasts because it's where you know 70 percent of our listeners are on apple so it helps us find more people seemingly who love apple over spotify i don't know 30 percent use spotify 70 percent. i don't know how right? that's just the market uh obviously we've got a website scaleartspodcast.com so if you want you can get full transcripts of this uh, episode on there you can also go to youtube if you'd rather watch the video version uh, of the full episode uh, and if you want to follow us on socials, you'll find us on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. And uh, like now, I, I, I don't spend a huge amount of time on most of them other than maybe LinkedIn, uh, where you'll see me most. Um, and for our community, just a thought to leave with you to leave you with today. The only thing that can guarantee that you will not scale is actually giving up is the lack of persistence that you just heard Nahal talk about because in, you have to stay unshakable in your faith that you will get there and you have to remain open and flexible to, you know, sort of new behaviors, new ways of doing things, uh, staying flexible in your approach, but you can't give up in the absence of giving up. Stick at it. Hopefully you'll get there. Uh, you've been listening to the Scale Arts Podcast. I'm Sean Steele, and I look forward to speaking to you again next week. Thanks so much, Nihal. Thank you so much, Sean. 
G'day everyone, just a couple of quick things before you go. If you have questions that you'd love myself or an upcoming guest to tackle about challenges that you're facing in scaling your business, please just jump straight on the website, scaleupspodcast.com. You can record your message straight from your mobile by hitting the button on the right-hand side of the page, or you can just email them the old-fashioned way, questions at scaleupspodcast.com. And just a quick reminder, nothing we spoke about today constitutes financial or business advice. If you are considering making big decisions in your business, seek out a professional who can look at your situation in detail and make sure you're getting sound, personalized advice. Thanks for listening. Look forward to being back in your podcast feed next week. Mm -hmm.